Capital Life Church began with a small group. That's how we began. Eight individuals in a living room, in our living room, at least in my living room. And I remember that three of the eight had just helped us get here from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they were turning around to leave. Uh, and the, uh, out of the eight, five had the last name Schuler. It did not seem like a very successful launch, <laughs> but the word was getting out, and our friends were telling people across the nation, attached to what the Schulers have come to launch in the nation's capital area, and we made our very first friends, remember, David and Rebecca Contreras, that, that stood with us and helped us and began to bring delegations over from the White House where they worked, and it just began a church. And it was beautiful to see that I can tell you in those early days, it was a Bible study, a time of worship, and barbecues. We had a lot of barbecues. And people would get together at, at different people's homes, and we would eat together and have fellowship. It is biblical. Did you know eating together is biblical? And God moves in settings where we gather together in the name of Jesus and we worship together, and we become a family. And I want to share with you what is the mission statement of Capital Life Church. It begins with a sentence that states, loving God authentically. Now, the primary way by which we love God authentically is on Sunday mornings in our main services. That's when we're going to have that widest door open and, and we'll have people coming in who have never been here before. They don't know anybody yet. And do you know that in studies, there was a study done of almost 400 individuals uh, who had come into church and become involved in church, uh, churches, and 90% talked about the friendliness of the people being a real priority to staying at a church. In other words, they found a place they could feel it was family. Loving God authentically in our main services means that anybody who comes through these doors on a Sunday morning will be able to enter into worship just like we did a moment ago and will be able to share the gospel and will share out of this book called the Bible and the authority of God is in this book and this book is powerful, it's alive, it speaks into our lives because it's a love letter from God, it's the very heart of God being revealed and we will bring people into a uh, relationship with God through Jesus who died on the cross, God's only son, sent to the world because God so loved us. And he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Now we can hear that and it can sound like something that's religious, but it's all about relationship. And we desire for people in our Sunday services to love God authentically by the things that we do. We'll point them in that direction. But by no means is this the only way that we bring people to that first stage of the uh, mission statement, loving God authentically, because it's done all the way through the week and in moments like uh, Victory Bible School and in moments like when we have uh, C3 get together our, uh, that we'll, you'll hear about in a moment what C3 is all about, uh, and those are our young professionals and and that is an incredible group being led by an awesome team. And Pastor Jeff uh, is right there in the leadership. And Amanda, who's right here on the front row to make sure that I hear an amen now and then, uh, is in the leadership. And they, they have a great team. And so we encourage everybody to be a part of that. If you are in your 20s, your 30s, or you look like a really young 40-year-old, um, <laughs> But come on to the lunches that they talk about when you hear there's going to be a C3 lunch because after the second service, they go to lunch and all gather together. And that, again, is a biblical concept. We may think the only time that God activity is happening is when uh, the word of God is spoken out. Well, absolutely, God's word is powerful and is like a two-edged sword and will not return void. But the Bible speaks also of the gathering of us together and to be intentional about that and not to neglect it. That's biblical. And so loving God authentically is happening all the way through the week through our women's ministry, through our men's ministry, uh, also through our prayer ministry, through our outreach ministry, a number of ways. The second part of the mission statement is 
growing together intentionally. Now, the Washington, D.C. metro area can be a very lonely place to live. You can be on the road going a half hour to go eat, and then you have to go a half hour the other direction to go shop, and then you've got to, you know, you know what I'm saying. And you get on the freeway and everything slows down, unless you have one of those express passes that never make any sense whatsoever with where you're supposed to turn it and how and with how many in the vehicle. But growing together intentionally is primarily done at Capital Life Church through our life groups. And I'll be talking about our life groups a bit today, and we're launching again this session of life groups. So there's an intentionality of that. We want to grow in the things of God. Amen? We want to grow in our understanding of the Word of God. Not just the Word of God being in our heads, but being applied and lived out in our lives. That we'll know God's ways and, and His character, His principles, and that we'll abide by them. And then the third thing that we see that is in our mission statement is serving others sacrificially. And so here we are with a wonderful outreach ministry, and we go into the inner city. We go to touch people's lives who wonder whether or not their loved ones are even aware of whether they're alive or not or care. And so we make sandwiches, and there'll be more told about that in just a moment. So you're aware that everybody has the ability to be involved with that, and everybody should. The Bible says that we're to care about the least of these, and that when we do, we're actually possibly entertaining angels unaware. If you've done unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. In John 13, 34, the Bible says, a new command, this is Jesus speaking, a new commandment I, uh, or command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, that statement right there is a wonderful Hallmark card goosebump moment. Okay, well, great. We're to love one another, and we believe in love, don't we? And the most powerful concept really is love. And when you hear songs, the best-selling songs are love songs. The Beatles used to sing a song. All you need is... All you need is... There you go. And people embrace that song with, yes, I need love in my life. I want to be loved. I need that. So again, I'll speak to that in just a moment as well. But Jesus in these words said something that really pro provokes me in good ways and ought to do the same to you. He said, as I have loved you, so love. And now we're talking about a whole nother level of love. Now we're talking about something that ups the ante, lists the standard of excellence of how we are to love. It goes beyond knowing somebody's name and saying hello to them and talking about the weather. It goes to a deeper level in which we are finding out one another's stories and then we enter into one another's stories and we're a part of causing someone to know that they're loved by God, that they're accepted, that they're believed in. We're there to celebrate the high points of life together. We're there to be there with one another when things are difficult. And so in the scriptures in Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I love to see when people have done this well and they make lifelong relationships. You may think that the best relationships of your life go back to some time long ago and now are long gone and you'll never experience that again. But I'm believing that you can make some of the best friends of your life in the now. And if we will believe that together and be intentional about it, I believe that we will walk with people through life in a way that so catapults us forward in so many ways. I'm talking about you'll be healthier, studies show it. You'll have less stress, studies show it. You'll be more productive in the things that matter to you, studies show it. So I'm going to ask that Pastor Lisa come up for a moment because in, in my lifetime, I haven't known the decade by decade by decade best friend core group that she has known. It's been rather fascinating to watch. And just briefly, she's going to tell you about it. So um, we have a picture of my best friends growing up. And <laughs> so the bottom left corner is us when we were 13. I'm on the very top. 
And then the next one is when we are older than 13. I don't know how old we are in these pictures, but I'm on the right hand side in the middle. And then the last one, I'm on the left hand side in the middle. And so these girls, I had moved from California to Hawaii and I had, you know, left all of my best friends and I knew no one. And, you know, I know life is so hard moving to Hawaii. I'm sorry. You know, it's such a hard life I lived. But I was, thir- you know, I was 12 at the time and, and that was a big deal. And so I remember specifically praying and asking God to please just give me some, a best friend. And then I got an invitation to a birthday party that was a sleepover and 12 years old. And so these were the girls that we had the sleepover and we bonded that night and never ended. It was so incredible. And it was such an answer to prayer that was so specific. And it, it grew my faith as a child, you know, to understand that oh my goodness, he cares about those things. And so throughout life, we have stayed in touch. They were in our wedding. So Michelle's um, my closest friend and um, we are in touch sometimes, many times a week still. And then um, the one next to her is Brenda. And she was my crazy friend that we would do things, you know, well, we all did a little crazy things, but nothing bad, just crazy. (laughs) And so but we were the ones, I think our sense of humor was similar. And then the one here, so all three on the right. And um, so this is Heather, and we're still in touch in these things. And the other two, the one on the far left was my roommate in college. And I'm still in touch with her, but not as much. And then the one next to her, I'm very rarely in touch with, but I still love her in my heart, right? But these three on the, on the your right, looking up, have been... I would say as close, if not closer, than my sisters. I would share things with them that I would never share with anyone else on earth. And there's just such a bond there. And it began in prayer. And then not only that, they are all married to the same men that they married to originally as young women. We were all pretty young when we got married and and ended up Um, having kids, I think most of us much later after we got married, which is interesting. So it gave us a little bit of time to grow up. But all of our husbands are serving the Lord and our children are serving the Lord. And it's to me a real, it's a miracle story. Those that's so rare, you know, to find. And so I was thinking about this yesterday and even this morning, taking the coffee walk and talk with you all And so if you ever have have opportunity to do these types of things, I was so encouraged after that. I was so happy. It just made me feel like I've bonded with people again and in a deeper way, built friendships or made new friends. So I encourage you to think like that too. And also just a little thought, um, that's me in the wedding dress. I have changed a little bit. And next (laughs) Sunday is our 35th wedding anniversary. That's right. I'm sorry we don't have a picture of the handsome uh, groom. Uh, Was a picture taken of me at the event? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. So, no, this shows that it is possible to have these type of relationships, but we don't all know them. And church, by the way, is really the best way of always to be able to have close relationships like we're talking about. And we need them in life. Can I hear an amen to that? Uh, Especially in this area. We need to put down deep roots. And we've talked about this through the years, and it has become something that's almost been like a a tag word. I mean, everybody said deep roots, deep roots, deep roots. And what is meant by that? What is meant by that is a lot of people come to the D.C. metro area figuring you'll be here one to two years have a resume check on it, and then just move on. And the reality is there are so many of us that are in this room right now that will tell you, yeah, that's who I used to be, but I've been here a long time, and I've put roots down, and I'm so glad that I have. I challenge you to put down roots no matter how long you think you'll be in the area. I challenge you to do it for this reason. If you do not put down roots, you will not make deep relationships. You won't go beyond the surface level of somebody's name and just saying hello at church. And you'll never regret having placed down deep roots, even if you do leave in one year or two years, you'll still, by having placed those roots in 
and place them deep, you will have the relationships you would have desired to have in this season of life, and you'll be involved, and you'll be connected, and you'll be much more fulfilled. 2022, so this is last year, but it was post-pandemic, survey that was taken says that the majority of Americans find it harder to form relationships now since COVID. It's just more difficult. And in fact, one quarter of the people who responded in this rather large survey said that they felt anxious uh, uh, in regard to socializing. So they were anxious about socializing. In fact, the way that it was summed up in the study was that people had forgotten how to be friends. They had forgotten what it is to be in community. I remember years ago, and we'll delve into this in just a moment here, but years ago, I remember being invited. It was in our very first year of being in the D.C. metro area, and I was invited to an event where there were some uh, luminaries that were speaking, and some I knew, some I didn't know who they were, but they had books out. And so I went to the event, and Joe Theismann was there, the football player, and Mary Lou Retton was there. These were speakers, and she's so bright, she got the gold or several golds, I guess, at the Olympics. And, uh, and so they were telling their stories. But what stood out to me more than any of them was that there was a man by the name of Dr. Will Miller, and Dr. Miller, whose name I did not know, I didn't know his book, but boy, his book has become one of the top 10 books I've polled through the years and shared out of uh, for people to, to know what I feel impacted my life. His book was called Refrigerator Rights. And some of you who've been in the church for years know that from time to time we talk about refrigerator rights. But for some of you, you're thinking, what are refrigerator rights? And Dr. Miller uh, puts it forth this way. He said that refrigerator rights are the type of rights that a family member would have. The right to go, if they're with you in your living room, to walk over to your refrigerator without saying a word, open it up, get the makings of a sandwich out and begin to make a sandwich. Let's face it, some people do that in our home and we'd be like, you know, what are you doing? But Dr. Miller says that we ought to have people in our lives to whom we've given refrigerator rights. And he laments the idea that we're losing this sense of, uh, of a familial sense in our relationships. Um, Bowling Alone was a book that came out years back, and it got to a point where it could almost be in the dictionary, Bowling Alone, and it would have a definition to it. Because this book, everybody was talking about it. And the idea was that you uh, had used to have people who would come to the bowling alley and they'd be in a league and they would bowl together in leagues and that they loved getting together on a weekly basis and bowling. And a lot of people were in leagues. And then something shifted in our society and it got to the point where more people were bowling alone than were in leagues. And thus the title of the book, Bowling Alone. So what is the idea there? The idea is that people are neglecting coming together. And so when the word of God challenges us not to neglect coming together, and it's speaking of the early church and all the people coming together to pray and for the teachings of the word of God and for food, that's there too in the scriptures and Acts, then we see that that coming together has a purpose behind it that made the church so powerful it could launch all around the globe, even in the midst of persecution. So uh, it's, it's important that we have a focus on this summer with a mission or vision of what we want to have done before we get to the end of the summer. Because by the time we get to the end of the summer, we will be done with it. Well, that's an obvious statement, but I can tell you it'll happen like this. So why not set the sail to where the winds of everything that happens during the summer sends us in a direction? What direction do we want that to be? Knowing God as real as the breath that we breathe. Knowing God's word better. better. Being chiseled into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we would desire, desire. In other words, I want to see us closer as a family at Capital Life Church by the end of the summer than at the beginning. And yet people are going in all directions. We have vacations planned. We have this planned and that planned. But I really believe that if we will set the sail 
for deeper and closer godly relationships and thereby knowing God better and serving him better, I believe God will honor that. Can I hear an amen? There's a word that I, had, I did not know years ago, but then I stumbled upon it, looked it up to see what it meant. Propinquity. Propinquity. And it's the title of my message today. It means the state of being close to someone or something. Proximity. Now, studies will show us that when we are in proximity with someone, we're more likely to care about them, to have empathy for them, to enter into their lives, to learn their life story, and to share ours. But the Bible goes a step further than what we talk about when we say propinquity. And there is a word that is used that is the word shalom. Now, does anybody know the meaning of shalom? Peace. And what is really meant by that word shalom is not simply peace as in a general sense of peace. But if, if Amanda and I were saying goodbye today after the service and I say goodbye, have a wonderful week, and I say shalom, then what I'm saying is peace upon you, peace in your life. I'm calling forth peace for her. So all of a sudden, there's an attachment that goes beyond, oh, God, give me peace in my heart and mind as Bill Shuler is praying for something. And I am declaring peace over those in my life. You know, the Bible says shalom, this peace that we see, and as we go to that word shalom, that part of the meaning of that when you study it is, and hear this, the webbing together of God. The webbing together of God. So whereas we can look at a secular word like propinquity and think, well, that's proximity and being close to others. When we consider shalom, we consider that the ones we're close to, that's an intentional thing from God's heart. That's something we enter into, something we pray about. As Pastor Lisa was saying, that she prayed for a best friend and all of a sudden got three of them at the same get-together, and, and for decades now. So what we need to see is that God has an intentionality about the relationships in our lives. These relationships matter more than we know. And I'll read a, a thing in a moment about that as to why I would say that. But let's go to the book of Acts. We see in the second chapter of Acts, and we know that's the power-packed uh, dynamite chapter, second chapter of Acts, Launching of the early church, starting with the 42nd ver uh, verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So when we look at this, I want to draw your attention to the fact that they were in the temple court. And the Bible speaks of Solomon's colonnade. And that the believers, the early believers would gather together to listen to the apostles teaching the, the scriptures, to, to pray together, to break bread together. Some people say that's communion. Some people say it's, it's eating together. Um, and this is what they did and with sincere, authentic hearts towards God in what they were doing. The temple courts were the large. That's the large setting where believers would gather in our mission statement, the loving God authentically, I mentioned to you Sunday morning as our primary, but not our only, only or even our most important necessarily, but our primary open door for people to come into a relationship with God, to love God authentically. And so on Sunday mornings, that's what we do along with the other groups that I mentioned before, C3, men's, women's, prayer meeting, outreach, all that. But in Acts, we see another way by which they met. Not only were they in the larger, like the Solomon's, uh, Solomon's colonnade, but they were also in what was 
much smaller and more intimate settings together. And that is they met in homes, the Bible says. So that's the second part of our mission statement is growing together intentionally. Because with all of the things that are, are said and the worship that we're a part of and the things that we hear and experience on Sunday morning, it takes that more smaller, more intimate setting of being together with good friends of like heart and spirit to challenge us towards our callings and towards the times when we feel like we're high on the mountain, we should be celebrated. And those moments where we feel like we're down in the valley and all the air's been knocked out of us, we ought not be alone. That's what that time is between Sunday to Sunday is we are doing life together. We are loving on one another in ways that are very practical and being there for one another. In the book of Hebrews, in the 10th chapter, starting in the 24th verse, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So there it is. There's the declaration. Don't give up on coming together. And I know that there are people right here at Capital Life Church who have come up to me and said, Pastor, I can tell you we were watching online. That became our church. And we realized in doing that, you know, it, it was wonderful, but it wasn't being with people. And so instead of it being the convenient thing of always watching you know, online, we decided we needed to be in community again. We needed to come up out of this COVID thing and not make our new norm that we are now church online, church in bed. <laughs> what kind of church is that? Or whatever it is that we're just watching. And church with bedhead. Church with getting coffee while pastor's preaching. You know, we need to move beyond all of that. And so the number one characteristic in relationships is that people want to be understood and they want to be accepted. That's vital. The key component to a long-lasting relationship is affection. In fact, we tend to like people who like us. I'm going to take it a step further because studies show something that if you look it up, you're going to find there are a number of studies on what I'm about to say. Then I'll get back to we tend to like people who like us. We tend to like people who are like us. It's a phenomenon that's out there that there, are, there have been studies on the amount of couples, people who have gotten together and become a couple, who look like each other. There are studies on this. People tend to be drawn to people who are like them. People who have similar interests, similar convictions. And it is an interesting thing. Now, you may be in a couple where you say, As, uh, we don't look like each other. But there are a lot of people that do, and there have been experts who are trying to figure it out. How do we find our, our group of friends? What is it about all of this dynamic that brings us together? Now I go back to we tend to like people who like us, People whose words and actions show us that their goal is not to judge us, but instead to love us well. Unhealthy relationships place demand on one another. And demands without a heart connect are unhealthy relationships and tend to be destroyed. What makes people stay in relationship is the balance in their relational account or friendship account. In other words, value for value. I want to read you something out of a, uh, that I saw that I thought was good out of a gentleman's book. And uh, this is a man by the last name of Daniels, uh, Relational Intelligence. But in this book, he says, association breeds assimilation. In other words, there is no such thing as a casual relationship. All relationships are consequential. They are catalytic. They push us forward or they hold us back. They propel us into purpose, or they push us into pain. They bring joy, or they bring sorrow. They are incredibly impactful, even when we are unaware of their impact. Now he goes towards the word of God here. Paul told the people of Corinth, this author says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. 
And this author says, I'd like to pose a question. Why would Paul warn the aud- his audience, uh, the audience of this epistle, not to be misled? Could it be because he understands that it is possible for us to be oblivious to the impact that our relationships have on our lives? More than we know. More than we know. A friend of mine who was on my staff back in my chaplain days, university chaplain days, purchased a home. When I saw him purchase that home, I said to Lisa, let's go get a home. You say you love him that much, you you follow him that much, he's so amazing. No, not necessarily that. I knew what he made. He was on my staff. He made less than I did. If he can do it, I can do it. So we found a home. Now, believe it or not, our first home cost $89,000. I mean, and, and, uh, and we sold it at a profit. But at any rate, all of that to say, we affect one another more than we realize. Uh, someone all of a sudden in your group of people that had gotten kind of in their home and not much out of the home during COVID uh, says, hey, I'm engaged. And you're thinking, wait a second, you're engaged. I haven't gotten out amongst people much since COVID. And now you're setting up for a wedding. In other words, we really need to realize that we need to break out of this thing that keeps us from being in godly relationships whereby we are there for one another, love one another, and all of the benefits that come with that. And there there are plenty in the scriptures Uh, where two or more are gathered together, there I am in the midst of you. Um, One will put a thousand to flight, two will place 10,000 to flight. Those are military military terms, but it speaks of when the enemy tries to come against you, the power you have in God. All of those things, so vital. Partnership in the Bible, there are a number of things that we see as characteristics. We are to love one another. And uh, I believe we have this up on the screen for you. Well, I guess I should give you the, the scriptures. That's John 13, 34. We are to serve one another, Galatians 5, 13. We are to be kind to one another, Ephesians 4, 32. We are to submit to one another, Ephesians 5, 21. We are to comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. We are to edify one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. That's encouragement, much needed in our day. We are to exhort one another, Hebrews uh, 3.13. We are to pray for one another, James 5.16. And by the way, you'll be hearing from our prayer leaders in just a moment. I would love to invite all of you, whenever you hear prayer meetings or special events and there's one that I won't steal their thunder that's coming around the corner here. Um, and I really encourage you to come and be together with others of faith to pray. It's how we launched Capital Life Church. We were, uh, we were on the steps of leadership areas. We were walking uh, around places that were, were strategic and we were praying. And then until we got to know people personally, because we didn't know anybody in those days. We were going through phone books and praying for our leaders out of phone books, handing three names at a time uh, per week to pray for until we met them in person many times. And even some came in to be a part of our church, which was amazing. Uh, So we're to pray for one another. We are to be hospitable to one another. That's 1 Peter 4, 8. And I want to read this from Dr. Ken Boa before I ask Dr. Julie to come back up and to, uh, to guide us towards what we're doing today and getting connected to life groups. Dr. Ken Boa said these words. He said, there is no act that begins with the love of God that does not end with the love of neighbor. 